Hello, uh, we have a wonderful group of panelists today who are going to generously share their stories of how they've promoted equity and inclusion at their transit agencies through a new fare policies. My name is Carl Commons. I am the Chief Sales Officer for Init. I uh, am responsible for both business development, account management, uh, customer service, and managed services. But with that being said, I am probably the least interesting person on this panel, so I'm going to jump right in and start introducing our, our panelists today. Um, so first to my left here is uh, Kessia. She is a project manager in the project management office with a particular focus on technology and intelligent transportation systems. Uh, she's at Pinellas Suncoast Transit. Next is Monique Laird. She served as Spokane's Spokane Transit's Chief Financial Officer since October 2019. And then finally we have Brian Williams. He has nine years of experience at WeGo Public Transit in Nashville, Tennessee. He's as their Performance Oversight Manager. He holds diverse roles throughout his career. He currently serves as the Service Quality Department. He's responsible for data analytics, process improvement and development, contract oversight, complaint <laughs> investigations, and fair collection systems. Uh, but he sums it up best as we're just there to serve. So um, with that, I'm going to let each of our panelists kind of introduce their, their agency and tell a little bit um, about their, uh, their service area. So first, Kessia. Hi, good, every, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Kessia Harris. I am a project manager with Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority. It is in the lovely state of Florida in St. Petersburg. And um, we have launched our fare collection with the, uh, within it in, I believe, 2020. Um, so far, it has been an exciting journey. I know our customers are thrilled that we're introducing new forms of payment to them, and I'm sure they're looking forward to a lot more. Thank you. Great. And Monique? Uh, Monique Liard from Spokane Transit Authority. We're in Spokane, Washington, which is the eastern part of the state of Washington. So close neighbors to Init in their Seattle office. Uh, Spokane Transit covers a square mile area of 248 miles. We offer over 50 routes, uh, serving a fast approaching half a million residents in our public transportation benefit area. Um, we developed and deployed with Init's assistance our Connect Fare Collection System, which launched to the public on October 1st of 2022. So a little more recent than Kessia, and we'll look forward to sharing some more information about our project's journey. And Brian. Awesome. Hey, y'all. Brian Williams here from WeGo Public Transit in Nashville. Um, we operate a fiscal year from July to June. So last fiscal year for our local service, we did about 7.8 million rides. Um, we also do a regional commuter bus service, regional train service, as well as the paratransit service, but we go beyond ADA with that. So we do the entirety of the county. Um, we're about 84% of our pre-pandemic ridership for our local service. Uh, we launch our system within it um, combined with Gen Fair and Trapeze as well in November of 2020, we're on the tail end of our implementation um, and had some pretty progressive adoption as of late. Um, on October 1st, we actually just ended the sale of Magnetics completely on all our buses. So we are more so e-fare, which we've dubbed as Quick Ticket in Nashville, um, and exact fares only. Excited yeah. to, to be here and chat with y'all. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. And... Um, just if I could go back through you as a group, um, maybe you could go down and share some of the unique challenges that you're trying to solve with the fare collection or goals that you had in mind. Um, so go ahead, Kessia first. Sure. Um, one of the main goals of PSDA was to basically meet our riders where they're at. So whatever form of payments they had in their pocket was what we wanted to uh, get them to pay with. <laughs> so um, we are current, we launched contactless payment back in February. So far it's been going pretty well. We have um, had an adoption rate of I believe 3.5 which is steadily growing. Um, the uh, customers or our riders 
Um, they are constantly asking, are there any other ways? Are there any new ways? So it's something that they're looking forward to. That's excellent, too. And kind of same question for you, Monique. Yeah, you bet. I, I will say the big impetus behind our project was really the deployment of our bus rapid transit line, where we wanted to really give the power to riders to manage their ridership experience and reduce dwell times at the station. So we implemented all door boarding for our city line. Uh, it turned out our city line project was delayed by a year, but we did not let that deter the implementation of our Connect Fare collection system. So we proceeded ahead because we saw all of the access and equity that a modernized fare collection system could provide. And uh, as I said, delivered that on October 1st of 2022. That's great. And Brian, any unique challenges or goals that you had? Certainly. So at WeGo, some of the main goals that we were trying to accomplish was simplicity for our customers, as well as the operators that on the admin side we've committed to serve. So uh, before we launched Quick Ticket, we had maybe seven locations where you can buy our magnetic passes. Wasn't convenient at all for any customers. But since we launched Quick Ticket and implemented a retail network, currently we have over 100 locations where people can go from convenience stores to uh, gas stations in their neighborhoods. And we're still working through even finding small pockets in um, areas where minorities or those with low income live so we can put retail locations where they are as well. So Brian, I'm actually going to come back to you and ask a question. So what was this, you know, maybe you can describe the significance of becoming the first Tennessee transit agency to launch any form of contactless payments? Well, for those that don't know, you know, Nashville is the bridal party capital of the world, basically, next to Las Vegas, right? So we needed to do what we could to catch up with the times so that as people come into our city, they're able to experience the th same things that they can in New York or other transit agencies around the globe, basically. We wanted to make it as simplistic as possible where they don't have to worry about, well, do I have $2 to pay today? They can pull their phone out, download an app, or as I said, visit one of our retail networks and just get on the bus and keep it rolling. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Um, Monique, um, your transit agency is also the leader. Um, describe your journey from mobile payments all the way through to contactless open payments. Sure. Uh, much like Brian's journey in Nashville, we started by having really the ability for our customers to pay with magnetic stripes, with a smart card that wasn't maybe quite as smart as what we have today, and then obviously cash. And we really wanted to be able to have the rider control their economic interface with Spokane Transit. And so we wanted, when we launched our system, to be able to give them all of the tools to not only manage that economic relationship, but manage all of their travel, be able to track their journey and understand how they were behaving relative to Spokane Transit so we could support them in a better way and make sure things were equitable for them. Uh, so we initially introduced fair capping, which we obviously were not able to have with the older technology. Um, and we did that and we've seen a really fantastic adoption, which I'll, I'll touch on for audience, you know, don't know the questions yet, but we do. Um, and then we decided after we launched the mobile platform uh, that we wanted to keep providing enhancements to our riders so they could find their relationship with STA more easy and more convenient. And so uh, in June of this year, we introduced the contactless payments. Uh, we are seeing folks excited to be able to board without having to think about a method of payment. They can just hop on our bus, tap their credit card, and, uh, and go. And we were able to also, within its help, implement fair capping on a daily basis for those credit cards. So giving those riders that same functionality. Great. Excellent. Thanks. And um, Cassia, the, the theme of this panel, and you've, we've heard a little bit about this equity and inclusion. How has the transit, uh, the uh, Flamingo offered more fair equity? Okay. Uh, yes, we have definitely um, offered more ways to have our riders um, be able to pay. We know um, there is the, well, we have uh, pretty much prepared a program for um, riders. If you meet 20% below the federal poverty line, we have a program in place that um, allows you to 
pay for a monthly pass, only $11. We also have fare capping, like Monique said, where um, if you're not able to buy a monthly pass for $70, you're able to buy a daily pass for $5, which allows you to um, ride the system for the entire day after your uh, fourth tap. Great. What's your rate been like? Um, particularly, do you have any you know, success stories where you've promoted more inclusion and equity? first launched our fare collection system, we actually have been told we had one of the fastest adoption rates that in its had. In our first month, we had about 20% usage already. Um, we did a very nice job with Carly Courtright. I'll give a shout out to who's standing here, our chief customer service officer, uh, making sure we were advertising and promoting the benefits of the Connect card and the system. Uh, in November, so the month after we launched, we did a No Fair November to encourage people to just come and experience the validation process and tap and go. Uh, so it was really a way to introduce our community to the new fare collection system, have them really try it with uh, no charge. And I, we saw an uh, increase in ridership that more than doubled from the month before. Um, and now as we sit a year later, we are uh, fast approaching 60% of our overall ridership is being done through the Connect system. So we're seeing very, there was an intense desire from the community to move to a more modernized way to pay for their fares. That's quite a success story, so that's, that's great adoption. Um, Brian, can, can you share any unique fare-related offerings that, that you provide your riders? Absolutely. So for our WeGo local service, we do fare capping as well. We do it on the daily and calendar month level. Um, so right now, our calendar month pass is $65 for an adult. Um, very hard to afford if you're living check to check. But with fare capping, a lot of people can just add a little money at a time to be able to earn that. And in an effort to pull a lot more people in our system, we're currently about, I think last month, 49.37% of our rides happened on Quick Ticket. Um, we cut the price in half for fare capping. So instead of having to reach $65 in the calendar month, they only have to reach 30. And for our discount riders, it's half of that. Um, we've seen a large increase of uh, storage value, which is the money you have to use for best value. Um, we went from people, transactions being 30% of stored value to 70% of our transactions are stored value. And that's all the customer facing components, be it in person, at the various vending machines, online, or even the mobile application. Um, and we also, because you have to be really agile with these things, so we, we're going to charge $3 for these cards. But that can be a barrier for some. So we got rid of it. We made the card free, and to even pull more people in, if they create an online account and link that card to it, we give them $10. So here's some rides for you to actually ride on us to make sure you trust Quick Ticket, you understand how it works, and then you also have an opportunity to provide comments to my department so we can figure out another way to do something a little better. That's great. That, you're one of the only agencies I've ever heard of that offers a free, uh, free card. You know, most are charging, like you said, two or three dollars, so that's wonderful. Recently launched open payments, or it hasn't been that reach, then, but you've, you've seen that adoption grow. Um, can you describe the adoption rates, the benefits, and the positive feedback you've received? Sure. Um, like I said, uh, it's been a steady increase. Um, I know it's not as high as the other um, agencies, but we've slowly been introducing it to our uh, riders, um, especially for our tourists on the beach. You know, we all know Florida is a state with uh, ec the economy is all about tourism, and it's an easy way for the tourist to get on the bus who may not necessarily want to download an app. They may not necessarily want to get to one of our terminals to buy a Flamingo card, which is our closed loop card, but every tourist has a debit or credit card in their pocket or in their wallet. It's pretty easy to just pull that card out, tap, and go. So they've loved it so far. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. <laughs> Although I still collect the cards. I still, everywhere I go, I get a card. So anyway, um, jumping back to you, Monique, um, we've heard a little bit about your system, but what other kind of benefits do your riders experience uh, through it? Absolutely. So I think very consistent to what we've heard from both Brian and Kessia, we really wanted to make sure we were giving our riders access and equity. 
Um, on the access side, we have been working on expanding our retail network. Uh, we were very limited in terms of how people could procure their cards. Uh, they had to go to our transit center or do some online ordering. We've now worked to have retail locations. Many of our retail locations today are really just for card loading only, but we are expanding that network to be able to actually have riders go in their neighborhoods and actually purchase a card and then load the value. Uh, so we expect to have 50 stores uh, within the next year or so where we'll be able to offer that availability and access to our riders. Um, from the equity side, I think we've talked a lot about fare capping and we're finding the ability for riders to pay as they go and really let us help them maximize the value they get out of their relationship with Spokane Transit has been critical. So we're very mindful that people don't always have money just lying around to pre-invest in fares and their transportation for the month. And so we really want to help them through fare capping uh, by having them get the best economic value they can for those riding dollars. Yeah, it's great to be able to provide that benefit to the people that can least afford a pass. It's, it's difficult for them to get the best value and fare capping solves that problem. So. Um, Brian, um, we've touched on a lot of different areas, but what's maybe the most valued benefit of the WeGo card, and did it surprise you? I want to say probably the most value, and, and it's hard when you are so deep in a project or even in the transit industry for so long, you kind of forget that customer perspective. Um, something I use as an analogy um, with cell phones, for example, you can go online, you can see how many minutes you've used, what calls you've made, and things like that. Um, with our quick ticket card, of course, we have this online portal so customers can actually go in there and check and see, did my child actually go to school today? Um, where are they? Did they go to their friend's house like they said they did? So they can, they can get all that information at the touch of their hands without having to reach out to us. So I, I feel that our system's providing a greater level of independence to those that we've committed to serve as we try to bring ourselves to a newer age, to, to where we should have been probably 10, 15 years ago. Right, right. Well, that's great. So as this discussion comes to a close, I, I want to personally express my gratitude. Each panelist, I think, has shared valuable lessons for all of us. And your, your dedication to public transit is inspiring to many. And I hope today these conversations shed light on important issues and I hope they've strengthened and sparked new ideas throughout the industry and we can continue this conversation going forward for much longer than just these 20 minutes. So thanks again, everyone. I, I really enjoyed it and appreciate you. Well, good afternoon, APTA Expo goers, uh, colleagues, friends, competition, everyone who's out there in the crowd. Do stop by, stop walking. This is gonna be interesting and you're gonna not wanna miss it. Uh, this is in its Innovation in Fair Equity Live panel. Um, I will start uh, by welcoming each of them. Uh, starting to my left, uh, if you'll bear with me, I've got a brief bio on each of these <laughs> folks so that we know who's who uh, and that I don't get anything wrong, I got it all written down. And I need to put on my specs, pardon me. <laughs> Scott, that's better. Distinguished looking now. <laughs> uh, Scott is the product manager responsible for delivering the new Orca Fair Payment System in Seattle, Washington. The new Orca system, which launched in May of 2022, is an account based system leveraging open AIs, multiple third party contracts, and a unique data warehousing solution. Using some innovative solutions, Orca was able to transition from their old card based system with unparalleled speed with minimal impact to transit customers. Scott's background is in systems and electronics engineering, hardware software interfaces, embedded system design with a lot of experience managing various transit technology projects. Sounds about right. Is that you? I think so. Got it. All right, welcome Scott. Thanks Thank for you. being here. Uh, moving down the line, I will introduce Zach. Zachary Agush. 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 Agish. Oh, all relative. Yeah, I, I would have got that if I showed up on time for <laughs> our preparation. Thank you for being with us, Zach. Uh, Zach has been at RIPTA for nearly five years and currently serves as its principal planner for capital development. 
Zach's responsibilities range from long-term uh, plans for fleet decarbonization and management, grant writing, and research activities. Uh, prior to joining RIPTA, Zach worked in transportation advocacy and automated fare collection technology. Zach received his MBA in political science from Wheaton College and a Master of Science in Transport Planning and Management from the University of Westminster in London, England. So welcome, Zach. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Zach, tell us a little bit about RIPTA. Sure. Uh, thank you uh, for having me this afternoon. Um, so I'm from the Rhode Island Public Transit Authority, one of the two only statewide transit operators in the entire country, the other being Delaware Transit Corporation. Um, so by default, we serve the 1,200 square miles of the state of Rhode Island, um, about 1 million people in the entire state, of which there are 39 communities of which we serve 37 of them. The only two we don't serve is Block Island, which is an island, uh, so we don't, we don't have ferry service. Um, and a very small town of just about a thousand people who are on a um, eastern peninsula just, just kind of bordering uh, southeastern Massachusetts. But other than that, every community in the state of Rhode Island has access to the network in some form. Um, we have 240 fixed route buses, about 90 paratransit vehicles, and we also do manage um, the van pool program for the state of Rhode Island as well uh, with a contract. But otherwise, uh, we serve as the state's mobility manager. So that's working with, community, uh, with communities, working with employers to really uh, encourage alternative mobility, whether that's with RIPTA or with other operations and, and collaborations uh, throughout the state. Terrific. Doing a lot of good things for a lot of good people. Thank Great. You. Scott, how about your story? My story, I work for Orca. Uh, Orca is a, a group, there's a group of 20 of us now uh, that manage the ferry card system for the Seattle Puget Sound region. Uh, if you're familiar, we call it, we, we refer to ourselves as the Puget Sound region. Uh, there are seven agencies that make up Orca, uh, covering four counties, uh, multimodal as well. Uh, I think we add ferries to that, maybe a couple other things. Uh, we do around 200 million uh, annual revenue uh, in sales. And uh, we, we just got a new system and launched it a, a year, year to year and a half ago, May of 2022. Uh, I got a few questions for each of you here. Um, um, Scott, your story is a little bit different around the Orca stuff. Um, uh, you had probably some significant challenges in terms of migration. So you had an existing uh, Orca 1.0 where you're migrating to Orca 2.0. Tell us about how you, know, you put some of those pieces together, what you're planning and, and uh, and the approach was to, to managing sure. that. Uh, a lot of a lot of planning went into that. Uh, so we had a since 2009 uh, system that was de developed uh, way before that, but launched in 2009 uh, with the original Orca was a card-based system. Uh, and so we knew based on customer research, uh, customer survey feedback, uh, industry trends, we wanted to get away from that card-based system right. and go to a real-time account-based system for for a lot of reasons. Uh, open architecture, APIs, all that good stuff that you, you read off in the, the bio. Uh, but that was a big deal for us. We knew that the, there's 9,000 devices out in the field. They need to be transitioned pretty quickly because transition can be difficult for customers. Uh, you're, you have a system that they know well and love. Uh, they have a new system that they will learn to, to love. Uh, there's two changes there. One when you introduce this transition period and then another one when the system's fully launched. So we really wanted to shrink down that transition period uh, to limit the impact to our customers. Uh, and I think one of the ways we did that was, uh, happy to talk to anyone after the show, uh, but we uh, went ahead and installed all the infrastructure ahead of time, uh, cabling, new mounting brackets, and then built a uh, adapter to adapt the old equipment to the new uh, cabling and, and mounting uh, brackets. Uh, and then when the time came and we were ready to cut over, uh, we more or less cut the system over. We ran two systems in parallel for a while. Uh, they're talking to each other in a real-time-ish way, being one that's a card-based system. Uh, but we did that all on a weekend, to kind of sync the databases, cut over, uh, and then we were able to pretty quickly move through and replace those devices because it became more or less plug and play uh, after, uh, after we did all that pre-work. Right, right, and I want to expand a little bit on that because you know the planning and development work that you do, and then you've got the technical and the hardware side and the software and so on. So you got a technical solution, but um, maybe just tell us a little bit about your community outreach and the other things you were doing to to prepare uh, the ridership in the region for these big changes and what was happening there. 
Yeah, I mean, so, so I said uh, we're one of seven agencies. Uh, our, our, the Orca team has its own communications person at that point uh, that was helping coordinate with all the seven agencies' uh, customer outreach teams to, to get the information out ahead of time. Well, uh, uh, it's a fine line. Don't, not, don't do it too soon. Don't do it too late. Uh, but trying to find that right time to communicate with our customers exactly what to expect, one, during this transition period, and then later after that's done. Right. Uh, so I'd say we spent a lot of time go, uh, getting into that. Some of the early planning that took place, uh, less involved customers, but just understanding how to do this the best way that the agencies could, right? Sure. Uh, we don't have space on our vehicles to do two systems side by side uh, and run them together. So we had to have one validator, one place to tap their card. And so that was some of the discussions that we had early on. Yeah. I, uh, my colleagues over here, but I remember early on when I started uh, on the next generation of Orca, being locked in a room, a bunch of us uh, consultants, and just trying to figure out what's the best way to do this to right. limit impact to our customer. I can see Chris O'Claire out there and she's smiling and <laughs> nodding and she's not scowling and crying, so I guess it went okay. <laughs> it went pretty well. It went pretty Calling well. you out. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right, um, let's get, get back over to Rhode Island. So um, I, I guess one of the questions that we had for you, Zach, was what kind of what kind of results did you expect, um, you know, in terms of what were your goals for the project, the, you know, based on the challenges you're facing, and, and then how did the actual meet the, uh, you know, your expected results? Sure, so I think it's very clear, you know, just in the title of the conversation we're having, that the, the policy of fare-free transit is growing ever so uh, accelerantly. Uh, than the last three to four years. And it, a lot of it's been brought on by COVID and even before that from equity conversations. And so uh, for us, we found an opportunity through the FTA, through a granting program called um, Accelerating Innovative Mobility, which is actually uh, through the research office. And we had put in a grant proposal uh, to work with the city of Central Falls on a geofencing um, functionality using in its uh, fare system that we had just activated uh, would have been only four months prior to that, um, where we would offer uh, free service to those boarding at any of those stops within the city of Central Falls. Um, and then for some context, just for, for those listening, Central Falls is the smallest city in Rhode Island. It's 1.3 square miles. It has 22,000 people living in it. And it is 66% Hispanic Latino. And the median income is just below $34,000. So, we thought that this would be a group, good group of people who really did need the support of getting some relief, especially during the tail end of the COVID pandemic and kind of helping them get it back on their feet. Uh, and through that cooperative nature with the C in uh, providing supporting funds for the grant, we put that geofence across the entire city. So every bus stop was coded specifically so we could actively track rider behavior. Um, and so we could see how often people were using it, where exactly people were boarding, how that meshed up against the APC data that we were seeing, and better evaluate as we have a larger conversation as, 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 as a state and part of a larger conversation as an industry about what is the right direction to have this conversation. Sure, yeah, yeah, super interesting. And, and you gotta, you know, as all of you operators of transit agencies know, um, you can't do it just like everybody else does. Every city is different, every city has different uh, demands and uh, different, you know, planning and design, and and you've got to make it work for the people who live where you live. So, it's super interesting to hear kind of how you guys have all done unique things in uh, in a way that's really specific to the communities that you serve. So, super interesting with the with the geofencing stuff there. Um, Scott, uh, back back to you. So, um, how do how do you guys approach fair equity? Um, you know, using your new Orca system. That's a long, uh, potentially long answer. Uh, de uh, depends on where you want to go. I think we do a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> I think we do a lot of things. Uh, I'll, I'll run through some quickly if you want to dive sure. into details. Uh, one, of the, one of the things early on that we did is we uh, added a retail network or, or changed our retail network. So where our customers can go to uh, merchants to top up their Orca right. cards. Uh, and we had one of our agencies had this new uh, program, a racial equity toolkit that we used to evaluate our four county uh, area to see where we need, could pick uh, gaps in, in, in service and coverage uh, to to focus on recruiting those merchants into our into our system. Uh, we've had a long-standing program: uh, reduce regional reduced fare cards, uh, income-based 
uh, is, is one of those aspects. Uh, and so that's been happening for a long time, but I think with the new system, uh, we're looking to pour, pull more of that in, uh, into the Orca system and not uh, manage eligibility uh, within the, sure. the system and get access to that card to those eligible in our, in our region. Uh, we're also, another thing that we're looking to do soon uh, is open payments, and I think, as okay. you mentioned, Cash App, uh, I think there are open payment options for those underbanked and unbanked customers uh, that we can uh, create uh, an easier, uh, re reduce barriers to entry for those folks. Yeah, it's an ongoing conversation, right? How do you digitize that cash so that it simplifies operationally for you guys, but also maintains accessibility to your users? Correct. If I may just add, there's one other piece to this. So as we were doing that pilot at Central Falls, you know, we had only just activated our in its solution in, in Rhode Island, and one of the policy decisions we made at the very beginning when we turned it on was the actual implementation of weekly and monthly, weekly and monthly capping. Mm -hmm. And that was even before we did the demonstration. And so as we were going through it, I was noticing there was a lot of people who, because of how the structure of the demonstration, they ended up being charged more than they should have been charged if they were under the regular scheme. And so I had one passenger you know, they would board in Central Falls, but then would transfer in, in Providence, and then I would see activity over the rest of the day, and they would be paid easily over the daily rate, let alone maybe if we had a weekly rate, they would be doing the same thing. And so I think that's where, in fair policy, it's not necessarily cut and dry, but I think sure. it's part of the dialogue and the outreach to really communicate that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. There are ways to really uh, work through that, and to what Scott and Julia mentioned, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for us with the technology that we've procured to really go into open loop payments and to go into uh, Cash App and unbanked other solutions as well. So there's a lot of future, and the demonstration is just one part of a larger dialogue about equity. Uh, and it's one way to look at it, it's one flavor, if you will, but there's a lot of opportunity. Right. Well, that answered my next question because I was going to ask you what's next, what's in your future? And there we go, there we have it. Just cut me out as a middleman. No <laughs> Well, that, well, that's great. Listen, I really appreciate your time, everybody. And for those of you uh, out in the crowd here who would be interested in, in speaking with our uh, guest panelists here today, please stick around after.